In order to understand American Indian policy, especially in Texas, you have to put yourself in Comanche moccasins. Starvation is stalking the Comanches. They'd once lived in a land of plenty. Now they're on the edge of existence. Uh, with their domain shrinking, the amount of pasturage is shrinking. Um, pretty soon the Comanches are eating all those horses that they'd gathered and warehoused just to get by. It's an absolute disaster. Comanches uh, have a, essentially an economic devastation that's sending them into a spiral of bewilderment. Uh, considering how many resources they had just five years before, it's shocking. Well, what do you do when your entire way of life collapses in half a decade? Well, you, you try to see if you can get the old uh, methods to work again. So you start raiding into Mexico, which then means that you are now running against U.S. law. Uh, but in the old days, you could raid into Mexico with several hundred strapping lads all bent on the same goal of gathering stuff up to bring back into the Comanche Empire so that they could then attract girls and gain wealth and essentially be men. But now you have small bands of guys that are undernourished on horses that are really just the remnant of a once great herd and not necessarily even the best specimens. Uh, these guys are poor. And in fact, many of the old bands and the old war bands begin to just disintegrate. And you have new bands start to emerge. And Comanche warfare and Comanche raiding essentially goes from something that had been an awe-inspiring spectacle that had led the Mexican authorities to talk about it as a war of a thousand deserts. Uh, now it's just bands of marauders. And uh, these are treated like outlaws if you're the American military. Well, Comanche trade, as you can imagine, collapses. The Cheyenne, the Arapaho, they quit working with the Comanches. They head north uh, to, to the buffalo herds in the northern Great Plains uh, where they can try to maintain their lifestyle for a decade or two more. Uh, the Wichita's. Once a, a vassal state of the Comanche Empire, they give it up entirely and become entirely, almost entirely dependent on government handouts. In 1854, there's a piece of legislation that we oftentimes associate with the American Civil War, or the coming of the American Civil War, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But part of the Kansas-Nebraska Act is that it opens up that territory for settlement, including the relocation of some eastern Indian tribes into that region. Well, all of a sudden, you have Indians moving into Comancheria. Uh, tribes like the Sauk and the Fox, these guys had once been up in the Great Lakes. Now they're out there on the middle of Great Plains. Comanches try to fight them, but the Sauk and the Fox win. They're better armed, they're better supplied. So now there are way too many Indians and not enough resources to go around in an area with declining resources. Uh, many of the tribes in the Great Plains essentially throw in the towel and prefer some sort of government largesse to independence. Well, it's against this backdrop that you have a reshifting and realignment of the forts in Texas. The second line of forts, which is really constructed from about 1851 to 1854, essentially moves that frontier line west. And what it's doing is essentially it's not only containing the what's left of the Comanches, but also connecting with those overland routes to California. Now, this will e require an expansion and a relocation of many of these forts, while some are just closed down entirely. So some of the forts that started out like Fort Worth are essentially shuttered. Instead, they're replaced by uh, forts like Fort Belknap on the Brazos River near Graham. Uh, all the way down in kind of a great bow, generally poking out towards the west, down to Fort McCavitt, and then south down to Fort Clark, and then down to Fort Duncan on the Rio Grande. You know, one of the, the posts, Fort Phantom Hill, uh, comes 
and goes in about a three and a half year period because the government can't quite figure out where this line of fort should be. Uh, and they also don't even know how to uh, supply them. The northern end of this line of forts is supplied out of Fort Smith. The southern end of this line of forts is uh, supplied out of Indianola. Um, the United States military is making up its policy as it goes along at the same time that the Comanches are collapsing. Uh, that's the state of affairs in the southern plains and in the plains of Texas by 1854. Now, instead of having to contain a great empire, you're really having to police against marauders. Well, that's a whole different sort of approach uh, than you might have had to take had the Comanche Empire been up and running. Uh, the United States Army, in order to uh, save money, puts the less expensive infantry out on the frontier. You know, the infantry... They don't have horses to feed and maintain, so they're cheaper to keep. So they put infantry out on the Great Plains to guard against Comanche marauders. Well, this is not a good combination. Essentially, the Comanches just ride by the forts. So the United States Army puts cavalry posts behind the outward, the outermost line of forts. The idea is the Comanches go in, then the cavalry pursue them back into a net formed by the infantry. That doesn't work either. And in fact, these posts in Texas tend to be lonely, isolated. Uh, they're prone to diseases like scurvy because of a lack of fresh fruits and vegetables. The uh, folks that garrison, the, garrison these posts tend to be immigrants, a lot of Irish and Germans in the army in the 1850s, and the tactics don't work. Well, other than that, what's the good news? Well, the good news is uh, Americans absolutely do not wait for the military to secure the frontier before they move out there to the frontier. And all these settlers moving into the shadow of these forts all have all sorts of complaints to make about how poor a job the federal government is doing in protecting the frontier. <laughs>